Hi there. Hi, hi Tori. It looks like we had some tech. <laughs> yes, yes. I think that was good timing. That was pretty close to the end. It was. And that video link um, we could share with everyone who's attending. Um, it's on our website so they could watch the full video. And I was realizing as I was watching that, that I don't know if we prepped everyone that that was obviously recorded previously. That was a recorded talk um, a few months ago, back about six months ago. So I'm sure you all figured that out, but uh, that was the format. No, I think, um, again, our apologies for not acknowledging that it was the recording, but this whole topic, I think, as you mentioned, the idea of practicing conversations, I think would be most valuable, what I hear from the families that we work with at Gildos Toronto, and how to continue conversations. Yes. So with the information shared now, we'll open it up if there was any questions. I'm not seeing anything in our Q&A box. Um, but I know off the top of my head, two very common questions that I was hoping we could address, even if they weren't vocalized in the session. Great. Kim, I'm sure you hear too, but the theme of my kids aren't talking, they're not saying anything. Yes. I think they're okay, but how do I know that they're okay? Yes. Yes, I absolutely hear that often. And um, a couple things that come to mind that I regularly remind parents of, and parents, you may not have thought of it this way, but I mentioned throughout that uh, talk to trust your instincts. And that really is kind of the approach of when that comes to mind and you're like, I'm not sure if my child is processing this information, if they're coping well or not coping well because they're not telling me. Go through kind of those key pieces of um, assessment that you do. You may not do it consciously all the time, but you do it on a regular basis as a parent. You're aware of how is my child sleeping? How are they eating? Like, are they kind of, is their normal rhythm for sleeping and eating? Has that changed? Has that been disrupted? Um, what are their social interactions like? And that's both within your family. So are they spending kind of the same general amount of time with you or with other adults in your family or siblings as they did before? Or are you getting a sense that they're maybe isolating themselves more or wanting to be close to someone more than their typical. And then with their relationships outside of your family, with their peers or with their activities, are they wanting to spend more and more time kind of out of the home and with you know their peers or kind of immersed in activity, or are they wanting to spend more and more time with your family? Um, and then just their general affect. Um, again, you know, you can tune in, like they don't seem like themselves or they do seem like themselves and you know I'm getting that sense so with any of those changes it can still be very normal and very much a sign of healthy coping because we would expect changes in all of those things to some degree um, but start to monitor and start to be aware and then again use those questions of like I'm curious I've noticed that you know you're not as interested in going to robotics after school tell tell me more about what's happening for you with that like you can just try to hone in a little bit on the things that you're noticing um, and the last thing I'll say about that is I regularly tell parents to think about duration and intensity when you notice a change in your child do start to track it and ask others like if you're co-parenting with somebody, you know, talk with them and track it together. But how long is this lasting? Is this a day or two days? Or are we talking a month or two months? Um, if it's, you know, a day or a week or two, that's probably very much within the normal realm. If you're looking at a month or two, and especially if it's increasing in intensity, those are some kind of warning signs to reach out for additional support. What else would you add to that, Tori? 
I was thinking around the idea of when you were mentioning of a team and their social relationships. I've heard, you know, I desire the opportunity to talk more and I'm not sure how to do that. And I think of an example of, you know, a mom that was really desiring that connection with her teen daughter and she was coming home and throwing down her school bag and running out the door to go play with her friends. And yeah. that is something we know teens can typically struggle with, the sense of balancing their social relationships, that importance of that milestone, developing relationships, securing those relationships, but also wanting to show up for their person at home. Yeah. And how that can feel disjointed for a teen that's either not openly sharing the need. And one resource that I've provided is using a journal as a different method of communication. Yes. Because those face-to-face -face conversations can be really challenging for families, whether it's the individual teen or families, but finding different outlets to express your thoughts and feelings and promoting the emotional intelligence in your home, the awareness and using a journal to write that out, to initiate those conversations can be one way um, to really I check in. That. Yeah, I love that. And that was, that's what I was thinking is that, that um, idea around expression. And I think oftentimes we think about talking as the key like indicator of how somebody might be doing, but it, and so writing is a wonderful, like it's talking, but it's different, right? And it allows a different mode of expression, but it may also be music or dance or art or, you know, other physical activity. And I've given the example to parents before of like, let's say you were just with a good friend and you just talked about how challenging the last week has been. And that friend listened and then they said, you know, will you sit down at the piano and play me a song about your last week? And you're not a piano player. You're not musically inclined. And that can feel really uncomfortable, right? Like, I don't know how to play a song about how my last week went. And sometimes that's what we inadvertently do um, with our children and with our teenagers is we ask them to talk about something where that's not naturally what's happening for them. Um, so it's, it doesn't mean they're not coping well or they're not able to express themselves. It's just really starting to get creative with, okay, what are some, maybe we collage about it. Maybe we make a song list about it. Maybe we, you know, find other ways to express what this might be like for them. Um, but I love the journal idea. And I love your example because we know every family is unique yes. in their own experiences and how they demonstrate the emotional intelligence and the awareness to build on that as a family. Um, I really think that the idea of finding that outlet as a family, if you're a family that plays games uh, using a board game, like Feelings Jenga, I know I've shared in other sessions that we've had, uh, but finding that outlet and trying in the world around you as you navigate day-to-day -day experiences yes. to identify grief, emotions, and normalize it. Yes, yes. And normalizing, I really love how you talked about the teenager and just that, you know, that natural, it's a, it's a very much a biological, physiological, cognitive draw to spend more time with their peers. And so validating that, they probably do feel torn um, and they many times they don't, they're not even consciously aware. They just feel it in their body, like this desire to get away, but then they feel guilty and then they want to be with their parents. So it's just this really mixed up kind of situation and just validating that, that it's normal to feel that way um, and helping them kind of tune in a little more to what exactly am I feeling and what do I want? What helps me? Um, as we go through this together. Another question that I hear, and I spend a lot of time chatting with parents and caregivers about, and you addressed it initially at the beginning of the recording, 
was the idea of protection that families have, parents have, that innate intuition and that innate instinct to protect their kids. And yeah. even this morning, as I chat with a mom and she shares so vulnerably that my biggest fear is if I share the information, he will dwell on it. And that's all they'll be thinking about. Yeah. And I think it's important to remember that children have, unlike adults, I feel, the ability, this is what it does make them resilient, to go in and out yes. of their feelings. But if they're not given the opportunity to know the realistic world around them, yes, they might be oblivious. But to give them the opportunity to jump in the puddle of grief, because that's what they do, you can, they can feel the emotion intensely, if you share it. And they can go there and they can jump in the puddle. And then they can come out and bounce back and be happy and joyful. And that is what's remarkable for children to experience the vastness of our emotions intensely and different and we as adults don't do that as well. And teens can struggle with that, you know? Yes. But the thought of, are they going to dwell on it? Is that all they're going to think about? Right. What would you right. share on that? Oh, I love that analogy of a puddle. Like I, that just really creates a visual that I think is so true for children. They can be in and then they can be out and it can happen like that. Like, you know, um, and it's, I'll just say this and then I'll answer the question that you're asking, but it's the way that I often cope with, you know, I'm feeling emotional about a family situation, you know, a family that I'm working with that I care deeply about and experiencing my own emotions. If I stay present in the moment with the child that I'm with, they're present in the moment, we can cope in that moment, right? We can either be in that pedal or be outside of that, pedal, but um, if we bring it to the present moment, we we can handle that moment. Um, so a couple thoughts about that. It, it absolutely comes from a wonderful place, a very caring, you know, instinctual place of wanting to protect. Um, but children, all children are highly intuitive and children who tend to worry more, um, who tend to be a little more anxious are even more intuitive. Part of that anxiousness can come from the fact that they are highly tuned in to the things in their environment, but more than the things, they're highly tuned in to the people in their environment, to the point that there's amazing research that's done that our breathing will regulate together, our heartbeats can regulate together. Like when we're together in connection with other human beings that we care about and have a relationship with our bodies sync up, right? Our physiology syncs up. And for children who tend to be more anxious, they actually are more in tune and attuned. And so not talking about it, even though in our minds, we're thinking we're protecting them. They're experiencing all sorts of things in their minds, in their bodies of something is happening. Something is different, but I don't know what it is. And I'll often say, we don't want a child to go from this point of something is wrong because they feel it to I've done something wrong or something is wrong with me, which is a very common connection that they'll make, that there's something wrong here. My mom's acting different. My dad's acting different. Something doesn't feel right to them thinking about it must be me, something about me or something that I've done. Um, and every parent I've talked with, I mean, that's not what we want, right? And so it really is bridging that gap. It's finding that way to connect around the things that they need to know that could help them make sense of the situation. And the last thing I'll say, because this has helped me as a parent for many, many years, it's just a mantra in my own mind of what is my goal as a parent? And, you know, I, if I'm honest, I will say that early on as a parent, my goal was for my children to be happy. I want my children to be happy. And if my children aren't happy, then I felt like I was failing. There's something wrong. But when I really realized that that's not 
the goal that I truly have for my children. Um, my goal as a parent, what I realized is to help them cope with the realm of human emotion that they will experience through life. I want to equip them to be able to go through life and recognize I will have all these emotions. That's what a full and rich um, life is all about. Challenging, yes, but so when we shift our focus to my goal isn't about making my child happy. My goal is about helping my child cope with the realm of human emotion that they will experience. I'm going to approach challenging situations a little bit differently. Um, too. I love that. Difficult yeah. things happen yeah. in this world that are they tremendously do. challenging. And I know I do what I do because I can't imagine a child experiencing that without someone to navigate it. And the more we inform, include, involve yeah. children, the more empowered they feel control over their experience. Just like you and I, with anything in our lives, we have more empowerment when we have the control, the information. Yeah. Yeah. And I've had parents say to me, like, um, you know, if I tell my child, then they're going to start making their decisions, like kind of going back to that control based on my illness. And and that's true, um, depending on the age of the child. So let's say you have a 12 year old son who's trying to decide, do I go away for sleepaway camp this summer or do I spend that week at home with my mom who's going to be going through treatment? Um, that will be a part of their process, but that's empowering in and of itself that I know enough about the situation that I can tune in to what is best for me. And of course, with the support of their parent um, versus looking back later and realizing I didn't know that that was happening. And if I had known, I would have wanted to make a different decision. And feeling like that ability to decide wasn't an option. Um, and sometimes it's truly not an option. But if it is an option for a child to have some decision in the process, it, it long term really can benefit their long term coping with, um, with what's happening today. And their short term coping as well. <laughs> um, and it's and it's unique to each child, right? Like, uh, all of you who are out there can think about, you may have two or three or more children in your family. And one of them may be like, I'm going to choose to spend more time with my parent. And another child may be like, I'm going to choose to spend more time with my friends. And either decision is okay. It really is about finding that right fit for each child and for your family as a whole. Well, I think there's a number of resources that Gilda's Toronto, as well as Wonders and Worries, we partner together to provide this session today, this valuable information. We both hold a toolkit of resources. Um, as you saw in the recording, Wonders and Worries, and I'm sure you can share a bit more, Kim, have a couple uh, accessible resources for us here in Canada and Toronto today, Toronto GTA, uh, that will, I think, I hope be tools for your toolkit and your families. Um, but it makes me think I'll identify from Gildas Toronto, a program that I hope um, we can continue to build the awareness of that all members of Gildas Toronto um, have access to our Careful Steps program. And Careful Steps is designed to help parents and caregivers navigate these conversations and navigate your cancer experience together as a family and really one-on-one -on -one time to really talk about the specific challenges you might have for your own children, where you're at in your experience and me providing with you to the best of my ability, knowledge, resources, tools, even a thought to think about that will empower you as parents um, I know you shared in the recording too that these aren't one-time conversations. You don't just get one shot at preparing and supporting your children. You're already doing that by being here, being curious for information. 
Um, it's not the families I worry about that are with us. It's those that don't have access to the resources and support, but careful steps at Gilgis Toronto. Uh, please feel free to reach out uh, through our portal, through an email and Gloria, who will be sending out the recording of today and other resources. We'll make sure you have that. Hello, Gloria. Thank you for coming back to us. Um, but just want to make sure that everyone is aware of those resources. And Kim, perhaps you can share from Wonders and Worries, because I know you have an upcoming live education session that I think could be a, a continuation of today. Um, Yes, uh, I just absolutely love everything that Gilda's Toronto is doing in your Careful Steps program and just want to reiterate to all of those listening in, um, absolutely reach out and, you know, individualize, you know, the support that they have to you, to your family, to your children. And so at Wonders and Worries, with these talks, we call these our wonder chats for parents. And this was the first one that we released, but there is now a second one on the website um, or on the, it's a YouTube channel. The second one focuses on incurable illness. So it really touches on if any of you are dealing with a stage four metastatic cancer situation, that's a chronic situation. It, that second wonder chat focuses on like, how do I navigate this and, and help my child or my teenager understand and cope when I'm not expecting to get better, but I'm not terminally ill. I'm not dying. I'm in this place of living with a chronic situation. So that wonder chat is available now. And then next week, um, if you're listening live, January 24th of 2024, um, there will be a wonder chat specifically around end of life, supporting children and teenagers if a loved one's death is expected to be happening soon and how to guide through that. And then that will be available on the YouTube channel um, afterwards. So, and then we'll just be adding additional content. And then our helpline was mentioned in the presentation. Um, that's 844-WE-WONDER, which is 9396633. Um, you can absolutely call from Canada. You can call from across um, North America and talk with one of our child life specialists directly. And then our resources, such as our app, our website um, has lots and lots of resources. So just reach out. You can reach out to me directly, Kim at wondersandworries.org. I love to guide parents to resources that we have available. Thank you, Kim. And thank you everyone for here that was here today. Apologize for our technical challenges and appreciate your patience. Uh, but Gloria, I'll hand it over to you as you finish off our closing. Yeah, thank you all for showing up for yourselves and for each other today. Uh, as mentioned, you'll be getting the recording handouts uh, and the resources in a neat little email that'll come out in a few days. Give me some time on that to collect it all nicely for y'all, uh, as well as the recording that you saw live today uh, and the questions and answers that were presented. So thank you, Kim. Thank you, Tori. This was so fantastic and really informative to hear from you both and all your combined expertise. And we look forward to hopefully having you again. That's all from us. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.